Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, members of the Platform Party, members of the graduating of the graduates of today and their friends and family, it is really a great honor to receive this honorary doctorate. The topic that I would like to briefly address today is the topic of reconciliation. And it is very timely, reconciliation between uh, uh, Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people, something which is long overdue. Just one year ago this month, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, under the very wise and distinguished leadership of Justice Sinclair, uh, published their findings and some 94 recommendations. And in, I'm delighted that, in fact, in this one year, there has been some progress. Schools and universities across the country are now inserting courses on Aboriginal uh, history and culture uh, in their uh, curriculum. And also, they are paying particular attention to the scourge of the residential school system. The government has promised funding to correct drastic injustices in terms of funding for education and other aspects. People are not aware, most Canadians are not aware, that even today, before it is corrected, Aboriginal children in the Northern First Nations receive only between 50 and 80 percent of what non-Aboriginal children receive for their educations. Something incomprehensible, but the government has promised to rectify that. And very promising, according to CBC in the last few days, there has been a poll which shows that attitudes toward Indigenous people are changing among the mainstream society, and they're regarded with less hostility than in the past. This is only a start. The children and youth in Northern Ontario and in the Northern Reserves across Canada continue to suffer. And it will be a long, hard job to stop the cycles of violence and death that has started up there. I'd like to talk to you about my first trip to the north. I'm from a First Nation community in southern Ontario, or central Ontario, although I grew up on a, in a small village in Muskoka. And I have, uh, I, I saw back in the 40s what the reserves and First Nation communities looked like. They were rural slums. But I had watched in the Chippewas of Rama over the years has, as uh, progress had been made and that people found work. Industry was attracted. Young people, this year there are 110 young people from the Chippewas of Rama who are attending university. There may be some in this room. And so even though I had heard these reports from the Northern First Nations about constant disasters and tragedy natural disasters like flooding and human disasters like uh, the deaths by violence of so many people. I wasn't prepared for what I saw when I traveled up there for the first time. As Lieutenant Governor, one of my responsibilities was to make community visits. And so I focused, first of all, on those remote communities that had no permanent roads. And I, my first trip, I visited Kaseshawan, which is often in the news today, and the Wanaman Lake First Nation. And I found when I got there that these communities were in mourning. In the first, a 14-year-old girl had killed herself uh, by injecting Tylenol 3 into herself until she died. At the second, 
three children had hanged themselves in a suicide pact. I attended the funerals, I talked to the families, I visited other communities, and I discovered that a wave of youth suicides had been going on since 1987, about two years after these communities were opened up to the outside world by winter roads, and when the youth and young people were able to go out and see that they were not wanted in Canadian society, and also to realize that they were treated at a different, in a different way uh, from non-Indigenous uh, people. But, for, but most of all, by talking to residential school survivors, dozens and dozens and dozens of residential school survivors, I visited every one of those communities. There's 49 of them in an area bigger than France and Belgium together. The only part of the province where native people are in the majority. I discovered that the residential school system which had been going on, which had went on, which had gone on for a hundred years, and just to recall for those of you who may not be so familiar with the history of it, in the late 19th century, the Canadian government, in a misguided, and I think underlyingly racist attempt to turn Native people into white people, opened up a whole series of schools, special schools for Native children, which were more like reformatories than schools. And they sent the police out to take the children by force if their parents wouldn't agree. And you can imagine what those communities were like after the police had left and the children had, had gone. They were deserted, devoid of children. And at the schools, the children were treated as if they were inmates in reformatories. Thousands and thousands died over the years. But most of all, the children were raised without any love. They, were with, they had no idea of what, how a family operated and their parents had no parenting skills because they didn't have any children. They were taken away by the government. Then those children came back, and the children didn't know how to raise their kids, and they, their, their children uh, didn't know how to raise their kids until there was just complete dysfunction in most of those communities up there, which persists to this day, which means that when the children reach the age of 13 or 14, they have no hope. And this is what they told me all the time, no hope no purpose in life. Life has no meaning for them. And so they just opt out. So I wanted to help, but I had no budget. Governments were not interested in helping. I went to see the governments. I got kisses on both cheeks and no, no money. Uh, the public was not interested, and this is the real reason why nothing had been done all these years and while the residential school system was allowed to fester. Because people knew about the residential school system, but they would prefer to change the topic and think about all the good things we were doing in Sub-Sahara Africa or in the Colombo Plan and things like that, but just don't talk to us about what's going on in our own country. And so um, there was no public support for doing the right thing with Native people. But the only thing I knew what to do would be, was to look upon my own life experience as an Indigenous kid in the 1940s. My family, we were outsiders as Indigenous people in the village of Port Carling in 1946 when we arrived. Our first home was a tent up by the village dump. We moved from there into a three-room shack. We were faced with the racism of the time. We were called dirty half-breeds or dirty Indians. My mother was called a dirty Indian, which was the harshest, terrible thing to hear. But my glass was half full rather than half empty. This is not a story of tragedy on my part because there are great advantages of living up by a village dump. We got first pick of all the stuff that the tourists threw out. 
And what I concentrated on were the comic books. And so when we went to school, I knew how to read. And the village children, whose mothers wouldn't let them go and rummage around in the dump, didn't know how to read. And so uh, while being faced with bullying, we were also, I was also had this secret weapon. I knew how to read. I discovered the village library. I was able to dream of a different type of life, a better life. And then I discovered that the village people began to encourage me to stay in school. One of them asked me if I would be a United Church minister because I was going to the United Church Sunday School. I didn't want to tell him I was an agnostic. And later on, uh, so I finished my uh, up to grade 12 in school, and then a wealthy summer resident stepped up and paid for my university education. And I was able to travel to Europe, join the Foreign Service, become Lieutenant Governor. So this was a formula that worked for me, the power and magic of books. And so if the government wasn't going to act, I decided to use my position as Lieutenant Governor to do something. Because Lieutenant Governors were encouraged to adopt good causes. And one of my principal cause, other than mental health, was helping Native kids. And so I saw how desperate they were up there. And so I mobilized the people of Ontario in uh, NGO efforts. The first thing we did was to uh, collect good used books. And we collected a mi uh, over two million books. The people of Ontario stepped up. The police opened their PlayStations to, uh, at, to, as depositories. They had to park their cars outside. The military stepped in to help uh, deliver books, parachuting them into remote communities, even if half the time the parachutes didn't work. The military also sent in uh, convoys in the, uh, on the winter roads, and native airlines stepped in. And we established libraries, and children were soon lining up. And then I established a book club. I raised the money uh, uh, through uh, appeals to the public, and that book club has been going now on for 10 years. It's called Club Amique for Young Readers, and all the children from kindergarten to grade six in the, all the flying communities, and there is a 5,000 children, every four months they receive a brand new book and they receive their own club newspaper and it's wonderful. And then as was mentioned, the premier established, after I recommended it, a program of literary creative writing prizes for native children. We get 500 entrants every year. It's been going on for 10 years. And they get $2,500 and lunch with me. I don't know with which they can hardly wait to get the money. And most important of all, and this is something which is really not so well known, I established summer reading camps. They're originally called summer reading and mental wellness camps for all the 26 communities of the province. I raised $7 million from teachers' federations and uh, trade unions and corporations and anybody who sat beside me at lunch or dinner. <laughs> and I came up with a, with a model, gave it to Frontier College, and it became a great hit. And then when I retired, Frontier College has taken this across Canada. And this summer, they will be, they will be in close to 100 First Nations across Canada in the Pro, in the communities that are the hardest hit in terms of violence and suicide. And the kids that go to these camps generally are not the kids who kill themselves. These children, 8,000 went through the camps last year, and these children read an average of 11 books each, and two to 400 books were left behind, and it is a wonderful example of collaboration. And the counselors who go up from the south become role models for the children. Then, as it was mentioned, I then began to write books myself to try and change attitudes. And so this is a story of tragedy, 
but also a story of great hope and also of that if you present the case to the public, they're prepared to change their attitudes toward Native people. And so my message to the graduates today is inform yourself about Indigenous history. When I was at university studying history back in the early 60s, I remember my professor of history saying to our seminar class, the reason French Canadians are so backward is because they breed with, with Indians. That, and nobody, everyone was, took that as a, being normal. And I didn't dare open my mouth in those days. And then I was reading the uh, Creighton, the great uh, historian, who said the same thing, that natives were savages and inferior to white people, etc. And I recently, uh, one of the great uh, historians, not from this university, but who was, uh, also mentioned that, you know, actually, uh, the people who came from Europe were all uh, infused with the spirit of Shakespeare and, uh, and Descartes, and, uh, um, and they came and they met all these savages over here. I hope that you will inform yourself and realize that there is a lot of incipient racism out there and uh, have different attitudes toward Native people. And if you have an opportunity, become a counselor for Frontier College. They, they hire about 300 every year, and you get training, and uh, you get paid, and it will change your life. Thank you very much.